as you uh, heard yesterday, this year, in our three-year cycle of faculty talks, we are doing the Lord's Prayer. On other years, we do the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed. These are those things that you are promised at your baptism, that your godparents promise for you, that you will be instructed in. And so soon as sufficiently instructed, be brought to the bishop to be confirmed by him. So you need to know these prayers and not only know them by heart, like Father Murphy said yesterday, but know what they mean. My part of the prayer tonight that I've been asked to talk about is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we have had the perfect theme for tonight's talk all through the worship that we have done today because we have done both the Mass and Evensong for Christ the King. Now, let's face it. I think just about all of us here are Americans. Is that true? I don't think we have any more Canadians this year. And you know what? <clears throat> Didn't we prove in 1776, thereabout, that we don't need a king? Right? I mean, we really whooped it to those English. We showed them, right? Old John Hancock wrote his name thrice and big on that Declaration of Independence so that he told George, King George, could see it without his spectacles. He doesn't need a king. They've got a nice democratically elected form of government which, for the most part, does what we want it to do or we think it should do. We have no need for a king. And my parishioners, some of them may know that I have a secret love for a particular British comedy troupe called Monty Python. I know so, some of you have heard of that. And there's a scene in the movie of the Holy Grail where King Arthur comes up and, and uh, comes upon a group of peasants, and of course he's riding his horse. And he announces that he's Arthur, King of the Britons, to which one of the peasants says, I don't remember voting for you. <laughs> and they get into a nice long political argument about whether or not there should be a king in England. Because they're a collective commune. They all contribute equally. And yet the image of a king is one that is very pertinent, not only throughout the Old Testament, but it's an image that Jesus uses to describe what it is that we are a part of as members of the body of Christ. We are subjects of a kingdom. We do have a king, and his name is Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm glad that America is a democracy. Because I'm afraid who it is that would go ahead and be elected king. That's a whole other story. But when it comes to what is ultimately important, and that is your soul, your salvation, and the salvation of all of mankind, we do have a king, and we are part of a kingdom. We heard today, in the ultimate sense of that, Jesus before Pontius Pilate. We heard this during the, during the Mass. And we heard Pilate ask him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And a lot of the Jews were looking for a new king. They thought that somebody would raise up, descend it from David, and that they would lead them in a rebellion against the Romans. And of course the Pharisees, the leader of the Jews, knew that this was a perfect way to get rid of this problem maker, this Jesus, was to accuse them of treason. Because the Romans didn't care about all these religious arguments. But treason's another story. Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, well, are you saying this yourself? Or did others tell it to you? Pilate says, wait a second, don't, don't embroil me in on this. I'm not a Jew. Are you a king? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my king were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? 
Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Let me tell me what the next line in the gospel is. What did Pontius Pilate say? What was his answer? What is truth? It's truth. Right? It's all relative. That's what the world wants to tell you. What's truth? <coughs> Jesus Christ is truth. That's another sermon. But Jesus is a king. He's not the king that we think of. Uh, or, this, well, of course, England doesn't have a king right now, but we know what a king of England looks like. We've seen the pictures. And there's been some of very blessed and holy memory, like Charles I, who died to protect the church. There have been very good kings. But Jesus says, and as we say in this prayer today, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that there is a kingdom of which we are a part, and there is a plan for which we need to acquiesce. In other words, we need to make our wills look like his will. But first of all, we have a king, which means that he's the king and I'm not. We are his subjects. And like anywhere in an earthly kingdom, we can choose to serve the king and live peaceably under him and under his protection or we can be in open rebellion and spend every day fearful that the king's soldiers will come and try us for treason and kill us. Same is true in the kingdom of God. You have a choice. You may serve the living God in his kingdom and live in peace, at least internally, a peace that passes understanding. Things around you may not be peaceful. Or you can live in open rebellion, which is called sin. And, and sin may be fun and you may feel powerful, but it will get you in the end, and the end will not be free. You have a choice. You are free under this king. You have free will. But that freedom has a consequence. It's your choice. And in order to live in this kingdom that Jesus talks about, and you'll see in throughout all the Gospels, these wonderful parallels, Jesus describing the kingdom of God is like...